and you're up to 20. Oh, it talks to me now. All right, it is seven o'clock on the dot. I'm going to start letting everyone in and uh, we'll go from there. Now you'll continue to let people in the waiting room in as we move on. Yep. That way I don't have to worry about doing it, which thereby distracts me from what I'm doing. <laughs> Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we are gonna give ourselves about a minute or two before we launch into tonight's event, just to ensure everyone is able to join and doesn't miss anything. In the interim, as you all know, um, tonight's program will be on Zoom and uh, we do ask that questions are saved until the end. Uh, Jay will be doing his presentation and then we'll have plenty of time um, at the end to answer any questions or comments you may have about Connecticut's birds. And when our other co-hosts this evening, Margaret of the Gardeners of Simsbury, they will be sharing their pamphlets. So if you are interested in, that will be added momentarily to the chat and you can take a look when you have a moment. We do have closed captions on this evening. If you do not want to see them, you will uh, look to the lower level um, on the Sorry, my brain's a little fuzzy right now. On the Zoom menu on the bottom, it will say live transcript. And then you'll click on that and hit hide subtitles. And those will remove them from your screen. Tonight's program is also being recorded. So if you do know someone who was unable to make it this evening, they will have a chance to view it. We'll be adding it to the library's YouTube channel and sharing it with SCTV but it won't be available indefinitely. It will be available for um, a limited time. Okay, so Jay, it is about two minutes after. Okay, you wanna get started? People keep coming in. We're gonna let I everyone am. get yep. in here. Um, well, I'll, I'll let them all be impressed with my program appropriate shirt. If you can all <laughs> see that it's the evening. So I thought I should wear a shirt with owls on it. And maybe after this program, you can go outside in your yard and whistle in some owls. We'll talk about that later on as part of the program. So this evening we have Jay Kaplan. He is the longtime director at Roaring Brook Nature Center in Canton. He is a past president of the Hartford Audubon Society and currently serves as the chair of the Avian Records Committee of Connecticut a COA committee that evaluates rare bird sightings in the state. Thank you, Jay, for your expertise and your time this evening. And I would like to um, give you the floor. Okay, well, thank you very much. I suspect there are maybe a few people out in the audience, although I can't see you, that I have known. I've done some programs in past years for the Gardeners of Simsbury and other places around town. And we're going to be talking about birds tonight. Um, this could be a much longer program, but we have to keep it to an hour if we can. And I promise I'll hang around at the end to ask any questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in my, with my poor technological skills, attempt to share my screen with you and show you a PowerPoint so we can talk about birds and birds here in Connecticut. So let's get this going here. And let's see. What, let's see how we can, you know what the sad thing is? I must put my glasses on in order to see what I'm doing here. So bear with me for just a moment whilst I um, start here and let's see if I can pull this down so I can maximize my screen here, which I'm trying to do. Let's get this out of the way, here we go. All right, boom. boom. All right, I'm assuming everybody can see that. So let's get started with Connecticut birds. 
Well, first of all, birds are spectacular. There are some 10,000 species of birds in the world. Um, you know, everybody as, as a child even thrills to see a male peacock or peafowl displaying in order to attract the mate. Um, there are just so many wonderful birds in the world, strutting flamingos. Um, I'm not talking about the little plastic flamingos that people put on their lawn these days, but real flamingos, which are native to South and Central America and the Caribbean, and occasionally wild ones show up in Florida. Birds like roseate spoonbills with their funny spoonbills that they scrape through the dirt and mud at the bottom of a, a wetland in order to get the um, crayfish and other small animals that they get from the water. Um, there are some 300 species of parrots, including these rainbow lorikeets. These come from Australia. You may have seen these. They often use them in um, attractions. Um, people can buy little cups of sugar water and they land all over you and you can feed them. Um, something that I would prefer to go to Australia and see wild ones, but some people find that exciting. Um, I actually was lucky enough to see, whoops, why are we going ahead? This is not on a timer. Um, I was lucky enough to see this bird. This is an Andean cock of the rock. They come from South America, spectacular looking birds. And then of course, you probably saw the penguins at the Chicago, from the Chicago Aquarium wandering around Chicago, generating goodwill during the pandemic. People love penguins. Our largest bird is the ostrich. And our smallest birds are the hummingbirds and everything in between. So there are, as I mentioned, 10,000 species of birds in the world. We can't talk about all of them. And we're gonna try to limit ourselves to the birds that are found here in Connecticut. This is a very exciting season to be interested in birds because it's the tail end of migration. Migration started in March. It's now coming, spring migration is now coming to a close. And spring migration here in Connecticut is quite active because we are on what's called the Atlantic Flyway one of four major flyways in North America. We have the Pacific Flyway, we have the Mississippi Flyway, and we have the Central Flyway, which goes down between the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains. And the object is when birds are looking down when they're in flight, they're looking down at landmarks. They're not reading a map. And they see the coastline and they follow that. And birds come up through Connecticut and they hit Connecticut and they will migrate up into the interior of our state along the Connecticut River and then follow the Farmington River into the Farmington Valley. And what some people do, crazy people, I don't know any of these people, of course, they'll wake up really early in the morning. It can be cold early in the spring, pack themselves up with a binoculars and scope, dress because it's warm, bring food, and off they go for a day of birding to see what they can see migrating into our area. Well, one of the first birds that people look for as a sign of spring is the robin. And of course, the robin is very common right now. If you go out tomorrow morning, you'll hear something like this. And that's the song of the robin. A lot of people don't know that song. They don't associate, they hear it all the time, but they don't associate it unless they actually see a robin open its mouth and utter that sound. The robin is Connecticut's state bird. And birds sing in order for two purposes, really. The males sing in order to attract the mate and to establish a territory. A robin has a certain area in which it will look for food and build a nest and raise young. And it doesn't mind if a cardinal or a blue jay flies into that territory. But if another robin flies into that territory, they will chase it out and they will have sing-offs to see who is the stronger bird who can have that territory. This is a male robin. You can actually tell the male and the female because if you look at this bird, you'll notice it has a dark head. Its head is darker than its back. That's an indication that it's a male. On the female, the head is the same color as the back. Now, a lot of people are surprised in the wintertime to see robins. The robins that you see pulling worms out of your lawn at this time of the year, many, most of them go south in the fall but they're replaced by hardy robins that come down from Canada and Northern New England, and they spend the winter here. Now the ground is frozen and covered with snow, so they can't find worms. So what they eat are small fruits and berries, things like these small crab apples. And if you have several crab apple trees in your yard, you can have robins year round. 
Most of them will be different robins in the winter than you see here in the summer. In March, it changes. The robins that were here all winter go north and they're replaced by robins coming up from the south as the ground thaws. And this is true with a lot of birds as we, that we think of as year round residents. Take blue jays, for example. They are here year round, but the blue jays that nest here in the summer, many of them migrate south. If you go down to the Connecticut shoreline, oh, the first weekend in October or so, go to a place like Lighthouse Point Park, which is a um, New Haven City Park on the east shore of New Haven Harbor. In a good weekend, you can count 10,000 or more robins migrating over Long Island Sound as they head south. Um, some years, more blue jays stay than others. It depends on the availability of food. In the wintertime, there's usually other kinds of food for blue jays. They'll come to feeders. A lot of people feed the birds and all the winter is over and people have taken down their bird feeders or at least should take down their bird feeders and we'll get to that in a minute. Wintertime is a good time to study birds right outside your window. And if you put out sunflower seed, you'll attract what I like to call the big three, which are the black gap chickadee, which is a year round resident and its close relative, the tufted titmouse. Interesting thing about the tufted titmouse, up until the 1960s, titmice were not very common here in Connecticut. They're a Southern bird that has extended its range northward. Um, and part of the reason that some of these birds, I'll show you some others, have extended their range northward is because there's so much food available now during the winter in the form of bird seed. The third member of the big three is the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, it's easy to tell the nuthatches. They are the only birds that walk head first down a tree. They have an elongated hind toenail that allows them to do this. Other birds that come to bird feeders regularly are cardinals. I have a pair nesting in my backyard right now. They nest low to the ground as do robins. And sometimes they cause problems for people because remember I talked about territory. When a robin or a cardinal nesting low to the ground near your house at a certain time of day sees its reflection in your window, it thinks a strange bird is entering its territory and it will attack it and try to drive it away. Um, this is kind of fun initially when, when a cardinal is banging on your window for days on end, making a mess, most people don't think that's so, such a good idea. Um, you can't pull the shades because they can still see their reflection. The only way you can get them to stop before the nesting season is over, that is, is by covering the window from the outside by putting a, a towel or a sheet over it, at which point they may just go to the next window if they see their reflection. Um, up until the 1940s and 50s, by the way, there no, were no cardinals in Connecticut either. They are another southern bird that's extended their range northward. Another bird we see frequently at feeders is this one. This is a house finch. House finches are rather interesting. Notice the difference between the male and the female. This is called sexual dimorphism. In many species, the males are brighter than the females, so they can attract them with their bright colors. There's no advantage to the female being brightly colored because it might make it easier for a predator to find their nest. These birds are a rather interesting bird because they are not native to Connecticut. This is a Western bird. And they are here because back in the 1930s, they brought all these house finches from California and they brought them to pet stores in the New York metropolitan area and build them as Hollywood finches with the intent to sell them. However, that was against the law. We have something called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act signed between Canada, Mexico and the United States. They don't pay all that much attention to it in Mexico, but here they do, and that was illegal. So they took these shipments of house finches out to Long Island and dumped them. They liked it there, began to breed, and now we have house finches pretty much across the country. These are the birds that will make nests in hanging planters that are hanging from your porch or on a wreath on your door, on the, on the window. And I've, I had a call today about somebody who was amazed to take a wreath down on their house and find a bird nest with baby birds in it. Um, we urge them to leave them there until the birds have fledged and left the nest, then they can take it down. Now you might say, well, isn't this a purple finch? Purple finches do look similar to this. 
And this is a purple finch. Notice on the house finch below the red color on the male, there are those brown streaks. On the purple finch, it's white. Purple finch is a larger, more robust bird. And they used to be fairly common winter residents. They've sort of changed their pattern. Now we sometimes see them in migration in spring or fall. There are occasional nestings of purple finches. They like to nest in evergreen trees, but they're a pretty rare nester in Connecticut. Most of them go north. And in the wintertime, they seem to bypass us completely and spend the winter further south. So this is the purple finch, not to be confused with the house finch. Most of the finches you have at this point are going to be house finches, not purple finches. Other birds that change their um, patterns. This is sometimes called the snowbird, the dark-eyed junco. They come down in October, you know, just before the first snow and very pretty bird. They're a sparrow, they feed on the ground. These birds by the mid to late April have left and gone further north. They don't go that far north. There are juncos that breed up along the Connecticut, Massachusetts border in Bark Hampstead and Hartland. And on occasion, there'll even be junco, a junco nest here in the Farmington Valley. Somebody brought me a nest from Simsbury a number of years ago that flew out of a tree during a thunderstorm. Um, the nest was destroyed. They couldn't find the parents. So they brought in these two little birds. I thought they were chipping sparrows, but as they got older, surprise, they were juncos. So occasionally they will nest here in the Farmington Valley. Here's a bird that won't nest in the Farmington Valley. And in fact, this is a throwback. This is an evening grosbeak. And there was a time 30 years ago where in the winter, evening grosbeaks beaks would come down in great hordes from the far north from Canada, clean out your sunflower feed seed for a few days and then leave. The evening grosbeak was originally a Western species. And when there were a big spruce budworm epidemics in Canada a number of years ago, evening grosbeaks moved eastward to feast on the spruce budworms. And for a while, they were relatively common here in the wintertime. But the spruce bird budworm epidemics subsided. The grosbeak sort of went back west. And now they're only a rare visitor, um, usually maybe during October when they're migrating. Um, we rarely see evening grosbeaks in Connecticut any longer. Well, we do have a yellow and black bird. This is the American goldfinch. And they're quite obvious. Um, people will put out Niger or thistle feeders to attract them. Um, they don't look like this, however, all year long. In the wintertime, the males lose that bright coloration because there's no advantage to being brightly colored. That bird in the middle is a male goldfinch in the winter. And then in the spring, they molt and whoops, and they look really pretty like this. Goldfinch are the last birds to nest here in Connecticut because they wait until the thistle flowers go to seed and they use the thistle down to construct their nests. Now, in this picture, there's a bird on the upper right that is not a goldfinch. This is a pine siskin. And these birds sometimes um, come through Connecticut in great numbers in the fall and winter. And sometimes they're not here at all. This was a very interesting year because back in October, November, there were pine siskins everywhere and then they disappeared. They continued southward and there were unprecedented records of thousands of pine siskins as far south as Georgia. Uh, we anticipated in the spring, we would see a lot of pine siskins again, but we did not. They more or less bypassed their state, bypassed the state on their way north. This is sometimes known as a winter finch. Another winter finch, however, did show up in Connecticut this winter. And we'll just mention this one for a moment. This is called a common red pole. And at Nodbrook Wildlife Management Area on the Simsbury side, um, where they train dogs in January, there were um, my, um, migrating common red poles and they were there for several weeks. And amongst them was a close relative known as a hoary red pole, which looks very similar to this one, but is frostier. And people were very excited about this. Birders were coming from all over Connecticut to see this hoary red pole, which was there for a couple of weeks, along with the common red poles. So that was kind of exciting. Well, another bird group of birds that people would like, like to attract to their yards are woodpeckers. And to attract woodpeckers, you put up suet. 
You used to be able to go get seaweed for free from the supermarket. Now the supermarkets have realized that, hey, we can sell this stuff. So now you go and they, they mix it up with bird seed and they sell these suet cakes and people put them in suet feeders to attract their woodpeckers. We have the downy woodpecker and we have the hairy woodpecker. They look very similar, don't they? Both of these are males. You can tell because they have a little red patch on the back of their head. The females don't have that. Here they are side by side. The downy is smaller, although it's difficult to gauge size on a single bird, but look at the beak. The downy has a much smaller beak. The hairy has a much larger beak. Also, if you see them spread out their tails, the downy's tail, outer tail feathers are black and white spotted, whereas the hairy woodpeckers have all white, pure white outer tail feathers. Here's another woodpecker that used to be less common, but now they seem to be showing up more regularly in our area. And sometimes you hear them before you see them. They sound like this. And woodpeckers drum on trees. That's how the males attract a mate. And this is the pileated or pileated woodpecker, which is our largest woodpecker. Um, this is the model for Woody Woodpecker, because Woody Woodpecker was blue. And these guys are impressive. They're the size of a crow and they have this undulating, all woodpeckers have what's called undulating flight, or sort of like a roller coaster up and down. It's very cool to see one of these fly through your yard. This is probably now the most common of our woodpeckers, however. This is a red-bellied woodpecker, which is kind of a silly name because it doesn't really have a red belly. It has a little bit of a pink wash between its legs. Um, but it has that nice red from the top of the beak all the way around the back to the, um, to the back. This is the red belly. It'd be better off call, being called maybe the red nape woodpecker or the zebra striped woodpecker. But it's a red bellied woodpecker. And this is another one of those birds. When I first came to Connecticut, there were no red bellied woodpeckers around. This is a southern bird that has extended its range northward and is now probably our most common woodpecker. They're all over the state. Here's the woodpecker we don't see. This is the red-headed woodpecker. And this is a bird that's more common in the South and the West. People often mistake red-bellied woodpeckers for red-headed woodpeckers. But as you can see, they look nothing alike. A few, every, every year, a few red-headed woodpeckers show up in Connecticut. Often they're here in the wintertime, but they don't stay to nest. Um, it's very easy to identify this bird. It's got an all red head and a boldly black and white pattern wing with a white breast and belly. One last woodpecker we need to just briefly mention is this one. We talked about birds extending their range northward. Well, here's a bird that's extended its breeding range southward. This is the, the bird with a great name. This is the yellow bellied sapsucker. You can see a little bit of a yellow wash on the belly. You can see it has red on the throat and on the crown. But the easiest way to identify this bird is by that long white stripe on the wing, which is quite obvious both when it's on the trunk of a tree and when it's in flight. These birds uh, have extended their range southward. They're now nesting throughout our area. Um, they have a very interesting drum. Instead of a brrrr, like most woodpeckers, it's kind of a Morse code, a Morse code type of tapping. <laughs> that they have, and these are now quite common in our area. Notice the toes. Woodpeckers have what are called zygodactylous feet. That means they have two toes in front and two toes in back, and that's for hanging on the side of a tree. Most birds have three toes in front and one toe in back for perching on a branch. Well, alas, if you put bird feeders out, you also get squirrels. And squirrels have been a long time issue for some people. Some people like squirrels. They don't mind feeding them. Other people don't want to feed the squirrels and they go through great lengths to keep the squirrels away, including getting squirrel proof, -proof bird feeders. Um, sometimes they work for a while. Sometimes they don't work. And sometimes we get calls like this about squirrels being stuck in squirrel proof bird feeders and not being able to get out. This one we were able to rescue. Sadly, most people have stopped feeding birds and everybody should stop feeding birds at this point in time because now spring has arrived. It looks like this outside. And here's what happens to nice feeding stations like this. You already know what I'm gonna tell you about. 
bears. There are a lot of bears in the Farmington Valley. Um, don't be deceived, however, into thinking that there were more bears in Avon and Simsbury than anywhere else in Connecticut. I can assure you that's not the case. It's just that people in Avon and Simsbury, when they see bears, they immediately call the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection to let them know. I can assure you, people in Bark Hampstead and Heartland and Northwestern Connecticut, they don't call anybody when they see bears because they're used to them. They're just part of their, their lifestyle up there. Um, bears love birdseed. And when they come out of hibernation in the spring, they're hungry. And, you know, after a friend of mine took this picture, that bear ripped his $80 feeder off that pole and tore it up. Um, that's what they're going to do. Fortunately, the black bears here in our area are not particularly aggressive, but that doesn't mean that they're your friends either. And nobody should walk up to them to try to get a good photo. And you certainly don't want to, at this time of the year, get between a mother bear and her cubs. But the bottom line is they're not really interested in you. They're just interested in food and they will also eat natural food, berries, acorns, grass, just about anything. They're omnivorous. Um, this is not, however, a program on bears. If you have questions about bears, we can maybe touch on those later on. Bears like acorns and so do birds. Acorns are a very important food. And in some years we have an abundance of acorns and in some years we do not. Nature moves in cycles and every few years, the oak trees of an area will take the year off and they will not produce any acorns. That's why in those years, more blue jays migrate south and you may see fewer um, squirrels around that winter because they'll migrate from areas where there are no acorns to areas where there are. Last year, we had very few acorns here in our area, but in the next town over in New Hartford, there were a lot of them. There are pioneer records of large numbers of squirrels moving across the landscape in the fall, even swimming across the rivers to get to places where there's more to eat. We see that now, except unfortunately we see it on the roadways and that's why there are more squirrels that get hit by cars in the fall mm. than at other seasons. Lots of birds eat acorns. While turkeys, a good percentage of the wood ducks diet in the fall is acorns. And blue jays, as I mentioned earlier, also eat a lot of acorns. But let's talk about water birds because Simsbury is blessed with a number of nice aquatic habitats. Besides the Farmington River, there are places like Great Pond State Forest, the ponds at Nodbrook Wildlife Management Area, the wetlands off Iron Horse Boulevard. And a trip to these places can net you a lot of different types of birds that you won't see in your yards. Take waterfowl. These are the more common ducks. These are mallards. And interestingly enough, mallards are not originally native to Connecticut either. Mallards are a Western duck that were brought here originally for hunting purposes. And that's how the mallards got here. Now there are many more mallards than anything else. Even more common than mallards, however, are these guys. You know, when I was a kid, I remember seeing flocks of Canada geese far overhead so high that you couldn't even honk, hear them honk in spring and fall as they move from their nesting grounds in the far north to their wintering grounds further south where the water doesn't freeze. Unfortunately, people started feeding these birds and on Hartford Audubon's Christmas bird counts for the Hartford area, we can count as many of, as 10,000 geese around in late December. They feed in the waste cornfields, they feed, and on, they don't eat in the water like ducks do. They basically are like cows and they feed on grass. If you've ever tried to play golf or had watched a soccer game where the geese have been frequenting those areas, you know what a problem it can be. People should not be feeding the geese. It doesn't do them any good to congregate in large numbers because it helps breed diseases that are transmittable. And it also um, doesn't, um, do the environment, environment any good when geese are defecating in reservoirs where, where it's supposed to be drinking water or in ponds where people want to go swimming, Stratton Brook being an example. We have, great, we have a nice great blue heron rookery in Simsbury off Iron Horse Boulevard. You can go on Helen's Way and in that vicinity, look out and see the heron nests. The young are in there right now. Um, this, this is relatively recent. 
there seem to be more great blue herons in our area than um, there were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that's great, except for people like who have ponds with nice expensive koi in them, or here at the nature center where we have many fewer frogs and fish around our pond because they've been frequented by great blue herons who like to eat them. Um, if you do a canoe trip or you're in a kayak along um, Farmington River through Simsbury, you might see belted kingfishers. They fly over the water, they hover over it, and they dive down and catch minnows to eat or to bring back to feed their young. They nest in the banks. And then there are bigger fish eating birds. There are now ospreys. Ospreys, when I first came here, were quite rare because they were affected as many large predatory birds were by the pesticide DDT, which people were spraying on their crops. And unfortunately, it got into the food chain. And these birds at the top of the food chain would accumulate DDT in their bodies, and it would cause them to not be able to produce calcium. Now, calcium, we need calcium for strong bones, strong teeth, strong fingernails. Birds need calcium for their eggshells. And what was that began to happen was birds started producing eggshells with um, eggs with thin shells. The mother would sit on them, the eggs would break, and they wouldn't produce any young. And so ospreys by the early 19, by the late 1960s and early 70s were almost extinct as a nesting bird here in Connecticut. They began to do an interesting experiment where they imported osprey eggs from Maine, where they didn't have a DDT problem, into Connecticut osprey nests. The Connecticut ospreys began to accept them and they began to produce young. Eventually, DDT began to dissipate from the environment. And now we have osprey nests throughout the state. In fact, there are a pair of ospreys nesting here in Canton on top of a tower down by the, on the, um, the, what, the old um, recycling center, the transfer station, excuse me, on Powder Mill Road in Canton. Ospreys have nested there for the past two years and they're nesting there again. Even better than ospreys, however, um, by the way, this is the kind of a nest that ospreys make. They'll nest on tops of big platforms. If you go down to the shore, you'll see that. But even better than ospreys, we now have bald eagles nesting in Simsbury. It is the nest, I don't, a lot of people think it's behind the high school, but it's actually down along the Farmington River on old Ensign Bickford land. Um, you can't really see it, but they're there and it's not uncommon to see bald eagles in Simsbury which 20 years ago was unheard of. The bald eagle has made a great comeback. Bald eagles feed on fish. They will also feed on carrion, but mostly they eat fish and you'll see them along the Farmington River. And it's quite exciting to see an eagle soar over your head or to paddle your canoe under an eagle that just sits there and looks at you as you go by. Um, our most common raptor, however, is this one. This is the red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks have a four foot wingspan. They're the birds, if you're driving along Route 44 or on Hot Meadow Street, you see a hawk soaring overhead. Don't look at it while you're driving, please. But you'll notice it's got long wings and short fan-shaped tail. And if there aren't any bands on the tail, that will be a red-tailed hawk. Another raptor that people are very interested in is this one. This is the peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcons are, according to some scientists, the fastest birds in the world. They've been clocked at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour when they're diving after their prey, which is other birds. Peregrine falcons also fell victim to DDT and there were no peregrine falcons nesting in Connecticut after the early 1950s. They used to nest on Talcott Mountain near Ublan Tower, but those nests are long gone. Um, again, because of DDT. They began to do reintroduction programs with peregrine falcons where they would release young birds in cities because cities have tall buildings which are like cliffs and they have an abundant food source. And a number of years ago, a pair of peregrine falcons picked this building, this iconic Hartford landmark, the Traveler's Tower, on which to make their nest. And here is the box they put up for the peregrines. Her name was Amelia. And you can actually go online. If you Google Hartford Peregrine Falcons, you'll find all kinds of information about Amelia. Sadly, a few years ago, they had to replace the windows on the tower. And so they covered with scaffolding and the birds couldn't nest there for a couple of years while they were doing that project. 
Um, when they took off the scaffolding, they thought they would come back, but they actually found another building a couple of blocks north, but sadly that one is not as visible to the public and they don't have a camera on it. So you can't watch the peregrines raising their young, but peregrine falcons are still nesting in downtown Hartford. Now, why would they nest in downtown Hartford? Simple, because there's a lot of food in the form of these pigeons. Um, there are a lot of pigeons in cities and this is what peregrine falcons like to eat. They will eat other birds that you find in cities, including house sparrows and starlings. Um, starlings are an interesting bird. Both house sparrows, well, pigeons and house sparrows and starlings were all brought here by the European pioneers. But starlings are, have a rather interesting history because they were brought here by groups in cities like New York and Philadelphia that wanted to have all the birds written about in the works of Shakespeare flying around here. So they went over to England and collected these different birds and released them in New York and Philadelphia and other places. And in 1890, they released 90 starlings in New York City. They released some more the next year and they released them in other places. And from that, we had huge numbers of starlings, many, many thousands of them. Um, and they're found across the country pretty much. Well, this is a problem. Why? Because they're non-migratory and they nest in cavities. And so, whereas birds like bluebirds might have nested in this hole, starlings and house sparrows who get there first, take over the cavities and the bluebirds would have no place to nest. And bluebirds actually became quite rare in Connecticut. When I first came here in the seventies, it was unlikely you would see a bluebird. But then people discovered you could put up bluebird houses to attract bluebirds. And if you made the holes an inch and a quarter, starlings couldn't fit into them. House sparrows still could, but if you put them up in areas where there were no house sparrows, the bluebirds would be quite successful. And now we have lots of bluebirds around. But unfortunately, we seem to be having a problem because in the last two weeks, I have had three incidences where people have called me very upset because people love their bluebirds in their yard. And one in particular here in Canton, the people went out and they found both the male and the female bluebird dead on their lawn. The babies were in the box. Um, they, the bluebirds had obviously not been attacked by predators. They weren't near a road. They weren't near a window, so they didn't hit a window. What happened to these bluebirds? Well, we don't know because we haven't had them tested, but we can be pretty sure that these are victims of chemical poisoning from lawn treatments. Unfortunately, when people treat their lawns, um, they, the lawn treatments affect the insects. Bluebirds fly down to eat the insects and then they get poisoned. Much as when people, people put out rodenticides to kill off mice or rats around their homes and then red-tailed hawks feed on them, they get poisoned and they die. And that's unfortunately a problem here in Connecticut with both bluebirds and with predatory birds like red-tailed hawks. Um, we have the baby bluebirds here at the Nature Center right now. Um, they're doing well, knock on wood. And after this program, I have to go give them their last feeding of the day. And we're hopeful in another week or two, we will be able to release them back into the wild. At least that's our hope. Bluebirds are not the only birds that will use bird houses. Tree swallows, they're nice, they eat a lot of insects. They will also use bird houses in which to raise their young. Any cavity nesters will use bird houses. That includes chickadees, house wrens commonly use them. And there are a few other species that will sometimes show up in bird houses. And sometimes they don't usually come quite this close to somebody's house, but they can if, if there's not too much activity around. Another bird that will use bird houses that or people get really excited about are Eastern screech owls. And Eastern screech owls live much closer to people than one might think. In fact, if you wanna find Eastern screech owls in Simsbury, the best place perhaps to find them is right along Hop Meadow Street in those big old sycamores that have lots of cavities in them and make great nesting places for owls. The um, screech owls also nest over by the Pinchot sycamore, which is a famous tree, of course. And screech owls nest closer to people for a very simple reason, because they nest in the, if they nested in the deep woods where there are great horned owls, they would get eaten. 
big owls eat little owls. And there are some places in Simsbury where there are nesting gray horn owls. They sound like this, they go. Hoo, 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 hoo. But if you hear that at night, that sound will travel for a mile. You've got great horned owls. This time of year, people are finding young great horned owls on the ground and they're concerned that they're orphans. They are not. When young owls get to a certain point, they hop up on the nest and they flap their stubby little wings and they fall out. And they hop around on the ground and the parents are still feeding them. And if they're not caught by cats, dogs, or well-meaning people, then they'll be just fine. So if you find young owls on the ground, unless there's a dead adult lying there next to it, leave the owl alone. Our most common owl here in this area is this one. This is the barred owl, not barn, not barn, B-A-R-N, but barred, B-A-R-R-E-D, because it has those bars on its chest. And barred owls have dark eyes, round heads, and have a very distinct call. They go sort of, it goes sort of like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Like this. And we actually have barred owls in an enclosure here at the Nature Center who have been calling. You can't hear it, but I've been hearing it while I'm doing this program. If you get good at this, if you practice in the shower, that's why people sing in the bathroom, that's good acoustics, and you get good enough, you can go outside in your, your yard and go, woo, 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 woo. And if there's barred owls around, they'll answer you, and they may even fly in to see what that strange owl is doing in their territory. Well, we'll get to some other things. Um, if you want to attract a lot of birds, the best way to do it is by planting things that birds like to eat. These are sumac, not poison sumac. Poison sumac is pretty rare and has white berries, but this is, there is staghorn sumac, there's smooth sumac. A lot of people cut these down because they consider them weeds, but if they're growing in an area, you don't mind them, leave them there. The berries attract birds. Lots of birds are frugivores, they're fruit eaters. Cedar waxwings are a good example. And remember I talked about the crab apples and the robins? In the wintertime, if you've got crab apple trees, you can also find cedar waxwings and other fruit eating birds, like the mockingbird. Here's an interesting story about mockingbirds. One of their favorite foods is multiflora rose, which you garden people, garden um, club people know is an invasive plant that should never be planted. But when they built the interstate highway system in their great wisdom, they planted multiflora rose all up and down it. They used to pay farmers to plant it as a windbreak. Now they, they're trying to get rid of it. But multiflora rose is, an, is a food that mockingbirds like. And it is said that the mockingbirds followed the multiflora rose right up along the interstate highways when they built them and planted it. And that's why we have mockingbirds right up through into northern New England now. They're another southern species. Well, birds do have their enemies. This is a Cooper's hawk what they used to call a chicken hawk. And sometimes they'll hang around people's bird feeders in the winter. You can see one on the right, sitting over a bird feeder, waiting for a bird to show up. When the birds know these bird hawks are there, they freeze solid like a block of wood because if they don't move, the hawks may not see them. Um, they have a lot of enemies. Here's another big enemy, cats. Cats kill one billion, not million, but one billion birds in North America every year. And some people are very proud of their outdoor cats. We wish they would keep them in the house. They kill a lot of birds and other small animals. And here in our area, if you love your cat, you keep it in the house so that a coyote doesn't get it. Cats are not at the top of the food chain. If you let them run outside, they become part of the food chain. And I realize that's an upsetting thing for some people to hear, but it's just a fact and I don't have any problem telling people that. If you want to protect your birds from predators, you can do something like build a brush pile that will enable them to take shelter in there so hawks or cats can't get at them. Small birds can fly into that brush top pile where they have some protection. Well, just a few of the more common birds that people like to see. We're gonna wrap this program up by talking about a few common birds and then a few uncommon birds. This is a morning dove and I'm showing you morning doves because people are calling me almost every day. When morning dove young leave the nest, as is the case with many 
what we call fledgling birds, they can't fly. And they are walking around on the ground. The parents don't stay with them. They come back every couple of hours to regurgitate what's called crop milk into their mouths. That's very pleasant. And that's how they feed them. And if they're not caught by cats, dogs, or by well-meaning people, within a few days to a week, they learn how to fly, and then they can get away from you. But don't pick up these young morning doves. If you're concerned your cat or your dog will get it, please bring your cat or your dog in the house, not the young bird. These are grackles. Grackles nest in colonies, often near wet areas and evergreen trees. They're a type of blackbird. And you know, people talk about the robin being the first bird to show up in the spring. It's not really. Here's the first bird to show up in the spring, the red-winged blackbird. And when you hear red-winged blackbirds calling, then you know that perhaps winter is loosening in its grip and spring might be coming. And then next week we'll have a blizzard. Because that's how things work here in Connecticut. Now we've got some of our most beautiful birds showing up. And these birds all nest here. They nest in Simsbury, but you have to be able to find them. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak, beautiful birds. They have a song that sounds like a sped up robin, a faster robin. They nest in the woodlands. Um, beautiful birds if you're lucky enough to see one. If you have brushy areas around, you might be lucky enough to see our all blue bird, the indigo bunting. They will sing from an exposed perch. Indigo buntings and rose-breasted grosbeaks show up in May and sometimes they'll come to a bird feeder for a bit until insects become more available. Of course, by May, most people have taken down their bird feeders because of the bears. And then perhaps my favorite bird, the scarlet tanager. Spectacular bird. They don't eat bird seed, but they love fruit. And if you plant blueberries in your yard, um, you can have scarlet tanagers coming down and at eye level feeding on blueberries. We don't mind sharing our blueberries with scarlet tanagers. Uh, they're probably my favorite bird. There are 30 different kinds of warblers that can be found in Connecticut. Some of them migrate through Connecticut on their way up to the boreal forests of Canada and Northern New England where they nest, but these nest here. And starting in the upper left going clockwise, we have a common yellow throat. On the right, we have a black Bernian warbler. The picture doesn't do it justice. Sometimes they call it the fire throat. It's got a bright orange throat and head pattern. On the lower right is the chestnut sided warbler with a yellow crown. You can see where it gets its name. And on the lower left is a black throated green warbler and they nest in hemlock woods and evergreens. Um, and all these birds do nest right here in our area. And then finally, our smallest bird is the ruby throated hummingbird. We have hummingbirds coming to our feeders. Um, some people have concerns with bears getting their hummingbird feeders. Other people get annoyed because downy woodpeckers or tufted titmice get to their hummingbird feeders. Um, but we have hummingbirds here. We have been lucky. Bears have never bothered our hummingbird feeders. Now this is a ruby throated hummingbird. If you keep your hummingbird feeders out into the fall, sometimes you could get something interesting. This is a rufous hummingbird. It's a Western species from the West Coast. And every year, a few of these show up here in Connecticut. Um, we had one here at the Nature Center a few years ago. Um, they have been in Simsbury. And so if you see a hummingbird anytime after mid-October, take a closer look. It could be one of these. Last year, there was a rufous hummingbird in Simsbury. Um, the people in whose yard it was didn't really want hundreds of visitors. Um, they lived in a quiet cul-de-sac. And so it wasn't reported because when you report rare birds like this, lots of people want to see them. Um, their hummingbird hung around until early December. And then one on one warm day when it was in the 50s, the hummingbird came to the guy's feeder and drank and drank and drank and drank and left. It was migrating south. A few years ago, a hummingbird like this showed up in Winstead. This is called a green violet ear or Mexican violet ear from Mexico. If anybody ever sees one of these, you call me right away. I don't care what time it is. I'll come over and look at it because this is a really exciting bird. There's only one or two records of this bird ever being seen in Connecticut. Because birds can fly, they show up in places where you wouldn't expect them. And we'll end the program by just showing you a couple of the unusual birds that have shown up in Simsbury over the last few years. This is a bird called a Mississippi kite. 
Um, it nested up near Great Pond a couple of years, and then it nested in West Simsbury one year. Um, there are a couple of areas of the state right now where Mississippi kites are being seen and probably nesting. There's a big, these are funny birds. They're, they nest in the southeast and south central parts of the country, places like Oklahoma, um, places like that. There are Mississippi kites. But one year, all of a sudden, there was a Mississippi kite nest in New Hampshire, another one in Pennsylvania, and the one near Great Pond. It was unprecedented because they'd never nested north of North Carolina. And all of a sudden, there were just these overshoots of Mississippi kites all over the place. And that has continued to happen. A very interesting behavior by these birds. This is a bird called a Western tanager. And Western tanagers usually show up in the wintertime. Every winter, there's one somewhere in the state. But two weeks ago, somebody here in Simsbury looked out their window and saw this. This is what a Western tanager looks during the summer in its breeding plumage. And they had one for a day at their bird feeder. Um, I was only there for one day, but they got pictures of it. And this is the kind of record that goes to the Avian Records Committee for evaluation. And because they have a photograph, um, this bird will be accepted here in Connecticut. And a couple of years ago, my friend Doug Beach was at Great Pond and saw this. This is called a very thrush. It's a Western species that you might guess. It's a relative of the robin. And this was the first very thrush sighting in Connecticut for probably about 10 years. They don't come here that often. And finally, here's a bird we've never seen here in this area, but we'd like to. This is our most colorful songbird with its bright blue and green and red. This is called a painted bunting. You see these down along the Gulf Coast and up as far as maybe South Carolina. Um, there are southern species in the southeast, but every once in a while in the wintertime, one shows up usually along the Connecticut shoreline, places like Stamford, um, places like that. Cove Island Park has had records of painted bunting. Love to see one of these here in the Farmington Valley. If you watch birds, you'll see them. And this is a good time of year to go out and look. Um, I am going to take some time to answer questions that you may have. And then after we're done with the questions, then I have to go feed all the baby birds we have back in our sanctuary. Um, these are birds that we raised in past years. From the left, going around clockwise, there's a blue jay, a robin, a cedar waxwing, and a song sparrow. Um, when I'm done with this program, I have five baby robins, three baby bluebirds, a baby red-bellied woodpecker. What else do we have back there? We have a house finch and a couple other things I'm not remembering. We've got quite a few birds here. Unfortunately, um, sometimes the parents get killed as in the case of the bluebirds, or sometimes people find really weird things like somebody buys a tree at a, um, a nursery somewhere far away. They come home and they take a closer look and there's a bird's nest in the tree with young birds in it. I mean, it's crazy the way we get these things. Um, unfortunately, there aren't that many people licensed. You need licenses. Wildlife rehabilitation requires a license to care for birds from both the state and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And there just are enough people in Connecticut who will take care of these birds. And, and they're just more than people can handle. And it's unfortunate. So we do the best we can. Um, and after I'm done answering questions, I'm going to go feed all those guys. So let me take my, stop my screen sharing here. And um, Margaret, you, do you want to unmute people so they can ask questions? How do we want to do that? Hi, Jay. It's Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Um, we did get a couple of questions in the chat while you were speaking. Okay. Um, have you seen any uh, is it kestrels? Kestrels, kestrels have gotten rare in Connecticut. Um, but there is a program where um, people are putting up kestrel boxes and they actually put kestrel boxes up on the tobacco barns at the north end of Meadowwood. Everybody's familiar with Meadowwood at this point in Simsbury. And I don't know about this year, but in the last couple of years, kestrels have nested there. There is a kest successful kestrel nesting in Canton off Cherry Brook Road. Um, believe it or not, I saw a male kestrel defending territory for quite a while at the um, 
where Coles is at the shops at Farming Valley, if you go to the back end of that Coles lot, there's a big open area there. Kestrels are open field birds and their population crashed, probably not because of DDT. Um, nobody's really sure why, but one possible reason is there are more Cooper Sauks and more Peregrine Falcons and they can prey on Kestrels who are smaller. We, although we don't know. But the Kestrel box is, um, is doing, um, helping to increase Kestrel populations here in Connecticut. Somebody asked about the whippoorwill. We'll talk about that. When I first came to Connecticut, I used to lead whippoorwill walks. And then in the mid 1980s, whippoorwill populations crashed. They crashed for a number of reasons. One is they're long distance migrants and they were losing habitat on their breeding range and losing habitat on their wintering grounds due to development. Um, they were also, because they nest on the ground, being preyed upon by house cats and other predators. And probably most importantly, because they eat large moths back in the early 80s, I'm sure if you're old enough, you remember the scourge of the gypsy moth infestations we had around here. And people just lost it and they were spraying all kinds of chemicals all over the place and probably doing in a lot of the whippoorwills that way. There are still, still whippoorwills in Connecticut, but they're far and few between. I don't, there used to be some, a nesting colony in West Simsbury, but I'm pretty sure that's gone now. I don't think there are any whippoorwills nesting in Simsbury at this point in time. We did get a comment about hummingbirds earlier. Um, one of the attendees lives on the hill behind Nassau's and has a bear take both their hummingbird and night feeder. Um, nope. They are getting considerably less hummingbirds at their sugar water feeder than in past springs, even though they're changing the water every few days and cleaning the feeder. Well, it's just, you know, a lot of people have hummingbird feeders out and there's only so many hummingbirds to go around. Um, there could be a lot of reasons. Um, their neighbors could be using herbicides on their plants or lawn treatments, which will affect them. Um, there could be um, other people who have hummingbird feeders that have stolen, you might say, their hummingbirds. It could be a number of reasons. But hummingbird populations have not shown a decline here in Connecticut at this point in time. That's great to hear. Uh, one person is wondering, is it possible to come to Roaring Brook and photograph your raptors? Um, by special appointment. Um, we, you know, you can come during our regular hours and go back there, but if you actually want to photograph them so there aren't cage enclosures in your way, um, that you need to have a conversation. But if you'd like to come photograph black vultures, you can do that pretty much every day because there are wild black vultures that have just lived here now. Um, they come to visit our black vulture, our captive black vulture, and you can walk right up and take pictures of them. They don't care. Um, we're open, our open hours at this point in time are Friday and Saturday from 10 to 4 and Sunday from 1 to 4. Um, when school ends, our hours will be changing. We'll be still open on the Saturday and Sunday hours, but during the week, we'll be open from 1 to 4 in the afternoon because we run a, a summer program in the morning. And unfortunately, we can't mix the children with the adult public. Um, if they did want to make an appointment for the photography of the Raptors, who would they be in touch with? they can call me okay. and they can just look up our phone number on the web and give me a call. And we, you know, we can't accommodate huge numbers of people, but we can do it from time to time. All right. Perfect. So we'll be um, on somebody had a, somebody had a question about timber doodles. I saw come up. Yep. That was the latest question. Yep. Okay. Well, timber doodle is one of the many fun names for the American woodcock. American woodcocks nest in wet um, meadows near forest edges. There are lots of places you can see them. They come out, they, you, you don't know, see them, it might be a stretch where you can hear them. You can hear them at dusk. They start by going bee, bee, on the ground and then they spiral 300 feet up in the air and do a courtship dance. That's how the males attract the female. Um, it's kind of hard to see them because they go up at dusk and if it's Unless you're lucky enough to see the little silhouette going up there, it's tough to do. But there are places you can see them. If you go to the shops at Farmington Valley and go back to the fence there behind um, Dick's and Flatbread all the way to the end, they're there. They're at Nodbrook Wildlife Management Area has Woodcock. And there are several other places as well. And they're still, they're still going up. So this is, you know, it's too early yet, 
you get in your car and by about 8.30 or quarter of nine, just before dark, you'll hear woodcocks. Okay, so we did have a question a little bit back. I don't know how to say this word, so I'm going to spell it out for you. It's um, L-E-U-C-I-S-T-I-C. Leukistic is what some people, people used to call that albino, like you had an all white robin, which I photographed one in Tariffville one year. All um, those, they used to call them albinos, but the actual name is leukistic. Um, and a lot of them are partially leukistic. For example, you could have, let's say, a grackle that has a white head and white tail, um, but the rest of it is, is all dark. Um, it's, it's just basically those genes, you know, create those kinds of conditions. And you can get any um, of these animals can. Usually a, a totally leukistic or albino animal will be white with red eyes, um, but you can have partial ones as well. It doesn't affect anything. Um, they can still be fully functioning. Somebody's asking about Carolina wrens. Are Carolina, whoops, it just went away. Are, Are Carolina, Carolina wrens common in this area? I have one who visits my bird bath daily. Yes, Carolina wrens are. You can hear them calling. They sort of go tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And Carolina wrens, like red bellied, started showing up about the same time as red bellied woodpeckers did. They're another southern bird that's extended its range northward. We had another question about bluebirds. Um, yeah. They stop by in a, a participant's boxes every year, but they do not stay. Any idea why? Well, there's possibly they're not cleaning out their boxes. They won't use an old um, nest that's got stuff in it from the previous year. Um, maybe there's wasps in it, or maybe there's something else in it, um, but they ought to clean. People should always clean out their, their bluebird houses before the nesting season. You can clean them out with a 10% bleach solution and then let them air dry and, and close them up. That will get rid of parasites that might be in there. But you also have to clean out old nests because old nests will also build up parasites and they generally won't use old nest boxes. Um, okay. Somebody's asking a question I just saw that is worth talking about. And now I forgot what it was, but it just flashed up there. See, um, if there's still time, I keep hearing a bird call like a crying oh, yeah. kitten or baby. Yes, that one. Okay. Um, cat birds make a meowing noise, but another bird that sounds what I think you're probably talking about is the yellow bellied sapsucker. They make a noise like that. That sounds like a baby crying or, or a cat. Cool, great. There seems to be a lot of birds in the area. Um, one on a different sort of subject is uh, there, a, one of the attendees says there's a, tree cutters are thriving in their neighborhood and they're wondering why these companies can rip down trees when the birds are nesting. I'm and sorry, then, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, one of the attendees is saying that tree cutters are thriving in their neighborhood yep. and they're wondering why companies can rip down trees when birds are nesting. And then separately, they're wondering, have you ever read Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Palami? Um, I'm familiar with him, but I have not read that book. Um, as far as the tree cutting, it's a continual problem for us. We urge people not to have their tree branches cut unless it's, it's a danger during the nesting season. Um, we get a lot of orphan squirrels that way as well. Um, it's just, it's a problem. People, you know, sometimes it's Eversource doing their branch cutting to prevent trees from falling on a power line, which is obviously, but, but sometimes people are cutting branches in their yard that aren't going to fall on anything and damage anything. And, and, and that should be done after the nesting season is over if possible. Um, somebody asked a question about crow roosts. Um, yep. Crows gather up into huge roosts during the winter. There's a huge crow roost numbering 10,000 or more, more birds usually on the West Hartford, Hartford line, sort of off I-84. Um, that roost starts gathering up in late November, early December, and then it dissipates um, in February. Um, most of those birds are Northern crows that come down here for the winter and migrate North again in the spring. They don't stay here. Okay. Um, I think right now we might want to give ourselves about, you know, a little bit longer. I think those were all the questions. Audience, if you have any other questions or if you wanted to sort of 
unmute yourselves to ask Jay directly, you're welcome to do so. Uh, do we have any ravens? Do we have any ravens? Yes, we do have ravens. Ravens look like very large crows. They have long wedge-shaped tails and they say never more. No, they don't really. They go, crows go caw, caw, and ravens go rah, rah, like that. We actually have a second kind of crow. There's also fish crows, which are smaller than common crows. There are fish crows down near Stop and Shop. And instead of going caw, caw, they go grr, grr, like that. And that's a smaller crow that originally was just found along the Connecticut shoreline, then started working its way up through the rivers. And now you find them in shopping centers. We have them in Collinsville. Um, sometimes you'll hear them at the shops at Farmington Valley, and you can hear them at Stop and Shop. Stop and Shop, you can hear ravens, crows, and fish crows, depending on the day you're there. Great, thank you. So I think that might be it for the evening. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for spending the past hour with us. We really do appreciate it and all your expertise. Oh, well, um, anybody has a pair of yellow-bellied cuckoos. That's excellent. I don't know if you saw that. Hi, yep, Leslie. the last one that just came in. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yellow belly. It's funny because I did a post. Um, some of you I know follow my Facebook post that I do sometimes. And I did a post about how there hadn't been any reports of yellow billed yellow billed cuckoos. There are two species of cuckoos that um, can be found here in Connecticut. There's the black billed and the yellow billed, and they feed on tent caterpillars and gypsy moth caterpillars. They're one of the few birds that eats fuzzy caterpillars. Knock on wood, we haven't had a lot of reports of gypsy moth this year, and I hadn't heard about any cuckoos at all. So I did a post on it, and the same day I had a post, I went for a walk and I heard yellow billed cuckoo. So so much for that idea. And now they seem to be just showing up a little later, but I don't think it'll be that many of them because I don't know of any big infestations of either gypsy moths or tent caterpillars this year. Okay, great. What a great uh, note to end on. Cuckoos in Connecticut. Yep. Cuckoos. Thank you again, Jay, for all your You're expertise. You're very welcome, Lindsay, and I hope everybody has a great night, and thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.